We're going to look at a whole Bible book today, all right? So, you know, strap your seatbelt in. We're going to fly through an entire Bible book, okay? Uh, and just to set that up, I want to put up some pictures. It's Christmas time, right? Family pictures, you know, for the holidays. So got some family pictures for you. This is, uh, this is my family with my mom and my brother and sister-in-law and their kids. Got my kids in there, my wife in there. And, and uh, right in the middle, we got my niece holding my first granddaughter. That's right. So... We'll zoom in on that. Let's go to my media family. And this, so this is, you got me in the background and then my wife Louise in front of her. And then next to me is my son, Jeff, my daughter-in-law, Moon, and then little Violet who turned six weeks old on Thursday. So she's a little tiny thing. Uh, and then you got my son-in-law, Joseph, and my daughter, Ashley. And if you look closely at Ashley, you can see grandbaby number two's on the way uh, coming in. Uh, February, and so, so that's my family, and here's the crazy thing. I look at that, and I think, my mom is 76, and um, we have, now, we have a grandchild. My mom has a great-grandchild, and I'm thinking, man, how in the world did that happen, right? Like, that just, I don't feel like a grandpa. Do I look like a grandpa? I say, I don't feel like a grandpa. In fact, when you look at this picture, uh, that, that's just from a couple years ago, you know? <clears throat> right? Like, this is Christmas just, I don't know, last year, year before. My, my son is there. He's like, I don't know, nine, ten years old maybe. My daughter's seven or eight. I'm not sure how exactly old they are. That does not feel that long ago. And now they're having their own kids. And that's crazy, isn't it? And isn't that the way life goes? Like, before you know it, your kids are having kids and you got this new title, Grandpa? It's like, how did that even happen? And then for my mom, you know, it's like I'm thinking... For my mom, it's got to be crazy to think, man, she just got used to her kids having kids, and now their kids are having kids, and she's got this extra title, great, in front of her grandma, you know? Life flies by, doesn't it? Uh, time races on. In fact, I don't, I don't know what's prompted it, but this particular year at the, the holiday season, as I've been driving around town looking at Christmas lights and some of that, um, my, my grandpa has been coming to mind a lot this particular holiday season. My, my mom was a single mom and didn't really have hardly any relationship with my dad. Uh, my dad left when I was three and a half, and I only saw him like four or five times over the course of my, my, the rest of my life. So I didn't, had very little relationship with my dad, but my grandpa filled that role. My grandpa was like the father figure in my life. And so um, my grandpa would teach me, you know, he would take me fishing. He's the one that taught me how to shoot a basketball, how to play ball, and all that sort of stuff. So he was like the father figure in my life. And, and so for whatever reason, driving around town this year at the holiday season, and I don't know, something would just trigger it. I think about my grandpa. And I would have memories of my grandpa, you know, walking in on Christmas morning with his big box of presents that he was bringing for us kids. Or um, Christmas Eve, you know, at my grandma and grandpa's church and the candlelight service. And he's just been on my mind a lot. My grandpa would have been 100 years old if he had made it to Christmas this year. But he died a handful of years ago. Um, and here's the crazy thing. I never knew my grandpa's dad. He was gone before I was ever born. In fact, I couldn't even tell you my grandpa's dad's name. Isn't that crazy? Like my grandpa was such a powerful influence in my life, but I don't even know his dad's name. And my kids, my kids, they, know my, they knew my grandpa a little bit. They knew him as Papa Pete. And they, you know, he lived in Western Washington. We lived here. So they saw him a handful of times and they, they had some conversations. And so they can picture him. They kind of know him. But, but my kids, they don't know Papa Pete like I knew Grandpa. They don't know him as the, the one who took me fishing and taught me how to play ball and do all that. They don't have those fond memories. They just kind of have some vague, fuzzy memories of Papa Pete. And little Violet, my grandkids, they won't know my grandpa at all. They might, they might see a picture you know, in a photo album someday or on a wall in our house someday and ask, who's that? And their, their mom or their dad will say, oh, well, that's your grandpa's grandpa. Oh. And my grandpa gets an O. Right? Isn't that the way life is? Like, it just races by. And before you know it, you're, you're, you're a memory, you're a picture on the wall, and you get an O. That's it. No memories, no fond affection, right? Just, just an O, and before long, you're forgotten. 
That's the way life goes. And it's not, it's not just us. I mean, even like our grand accomplishments and our grand successes in life. I taught at Boise Bible College for 19 years. I poured my heart and soul into students and in the classes at, for 19 years. I haven't taught there now for four and a half years. And I walked back on campus as I did a, a few weeks ago when I was doing some substitute teaching for the teachers. I walked back on campus and most of the students walk right past me. They don't know who I am. They don't know that I spent, you know, so much time there. They don't know that their internship program is the result of my work. They don't know any of that. They, they may have heard my name in the hallway, but they don't know me. I'm a memory. After four and a half years, I'm a memory. And I'm largely forgotten. All my hard work, all my poor, you know, my accomplishments, they don't know whether I was a good teacher or a bad teacher. They don't know, you know, whether I cared for students or whether I was hard to get along with. They know nothing about me, nothing, after four and a half years. And isn't that the way life goes? Life just races by, and before long, you're forgotten, your accomplishments are forgotten, your successes are forgotten, and you get a picture on the wall, maybe, or in a photo, if that at all, and most people don't know you at all. Kind of a downer, huh? Welcome to church today. We're going to get depressed, all right? It's a bit of a bummer, but it's true, isn't it? It's a fact of life. And we're going to look at the book of Ecclesiastes today. And the book of Ecclesiastes takes this fact of life and says, let's explore it. Let's wrestle with it. Let's deal with it. Let's, let's wrestle with the fact that life flies by and then it's over and then you're forgotten. And, and, it, and it looks at this fact of life, this reality, and it says to you and I, all right, in view of that fact, well, what's the point of all this? What's the point with all of this if that's what happens? And the way the author of Ecclesiastes asks this question, right up front, he sets up the, the table for this question in the third verse of chapter one. He says this, what does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun. What, what do you get for all these 60, 70, 80 years of life and all the energy and all the effort and all the fatigue and all the sleepless nights and all the effort you put into life if in just a few short decades, it's over. What do you get? What, do you, what, is, what is a person, a man or a woman, you or I, what do we gain by all the toil with which we toil under the sun on this planet? if this is all there is. And the answer, if you're familiar with Ecclesiastes at all, if you've read it in the past or heard anything about it, the basic answer that the author of Ecclesiastes gives us is what? What, what is the re repeated line that we're familiar with from Ecclesiastes? Vanity is vanity. Like the older translations, vanity is vanity. All is vanity. Or in the newer translations, meaningless, meaningless. All is meaningless. Well, let's just keep the depressing news going. <laughs> I mean, it's a bummer, right? Now, let's just clarify some things right up front. When, it, when the translations say vanity, vanity, or meaningless, meaningless, the word they're trying to translate is a particular Hebrew word, and vanity or meaningless doesn't quite capture it. It's hard to bring that whole word into English, and so they're doing the best they can. But the Hebrew word is hevel, hevel. Um, and hevel doesn't quite mean vanity, and it doesn't quite mean meaningless. And in the context of Ecclesiastes, it has more to do with this. Hevel, basically one part of the meaning of Hevel in Ecclesiastes is fleeting. Life is fleeting. It, it's, like, it's like the fog or the mist in the morning that within an hour or two is burnt off by the sun and it's gone. Life is fleeting. It flies by. It races by. And we know that's true, Right? I mean, that's the point. You look at family pictures, you're like, when, when did my kids start having kids? When did I get the title, Grandpa? Man, it just seems like a few years ago, I was, I mean, they were just born, weren't they? Life is fleeting. It's heavy. It flies by. If, if you're in the room and you're, say, 20, 21, 22, you're right around those, you know, the 20-year-old mark. And let's say, by the grace of God, you're, you're allowed to make it to 80, 81, 82, and you're 20 years old. Guess what? Your life is 25% done. You're like, I just graduated high school. Yeah, and you're 25% over. One quarter done. Right? It flies by. 
I'll, I'll be 50 in May. And, and if I'm lucky, I might have 15 to 17 productive years left. If I'm lucky. Like, I feel like I'm just getting started. I don't feel that old. Right? But life is like that. It's hevel. It's fleeting. It just races by. The other thing that hevel means in the context of Ecclesiastes, hevel means life is puzzling. It's puzzling. It's a little bit perplexing. It's a little bit confusing. It's a bit of a mystery. He says it's like trying to get a hold of the wind. You just can't quite grasp it all. What is life all about? I don't quite know. It's a bit of a mystery. It's a bit perplexing. It's a bit disappointing and frustrating and confusing at times. We can't always make heads or tails. Things happen in life that's like, why in the world did that happen to me? Right? Like life isn't always fair. Life doesn't always go the way you think. Life doesn't always turn out the way you expect. Life takes twists and turns where it's like, really? What is this all about? True, life is puzzling. It's like that, isn't it? Um, let's say you're, you're hardworking, you're diligent, you're responsible, you're good at your job, right? You, you take good feedback, but you can barely ever get ahead. And then this young guy comes along, and, it, and he's always getting the promotions. He seems to, everything turns out good for him. It's like, I have put in 20 years, and I feel like I have just busted my butt, and I can barely ever get ahead. Life is like that. It's, why is that? Or, or let's say uh, you're faithful to Jesus. You, you love the Lord. You're following his word, right? You, you're, you're, you're growing in Christ, and you can't get pregnant. And you look around at the world, and you think, God, you gave them kids? Them, really? Like, I would be a far better mom. I would be a far better dad than them. And they get kids and not me. God, that doesn't make sense. Life is hevel. It's puzzling. It's a mystery. You approach 50 years old and you're like, never thought I would quite be at this point. Never thought my life would turn out like. I never thought that would happen to me. That's, that's hevel. Life is fleeting. And life is a bit of a mystery. Life is puzzling. It doesn't always make sense. And so, in view of that fact, what do you and I gain for all our toil under the sun? That's the great question of Ecclesiastes. And what the author of Ecclesiastes does is the author of Ecclesiastes says, all right, let's go on a grand experiment and say, all right, in view of this, let's try to figure out what the point of all of this is. And so which, when you read Ecclesiastes, it's almost like reading his journal notes from his experiment, trying to find meaning and significance and value in this life that's so fleeting and puzzling. And so when you read Ecclesiastes, it can be confusing as well as a book because it's just kind of mixed up because it's almost like journal notes. It's, it's his experiment. Let's try to answer the question, what do we get out of all of this? What's the value of all of this? And so what I want to do is I just want to take a few minutes and I want you to, to read along with me some sections of Ecclesiastes and explore with him some of the things that are often tried to try to find value and significance in life. One of the things he tries right up front is he says, let's try, let's try pleasure. Let's try money, stuff, recreation, entertainment, pleasure. Let's have a blast while you last and see if that's the answer. And so listen to what he says in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 4. He says this, so I made great works. I built houses, not just a house. I built houses. I had, I had a vacation home in McCall, and I had another one up, you know, near Stanley. And I built houses for myself. Um, I planted vineyards so I could enjoy the best wine from my own vineyards. Uh, I made myself gardens and parks, and I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I had my own orchard, so I had fruit whenever I wanted them. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees that I had planted. I bought male and female servants. I had servants to tend to all of this so that I had the free time to be able to do whatever I wanted. Right? I, had, I bought servants. I had servants who were born in my house. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks. Like, to us, herds and flocks don't mean much. In their culture, that's status. That's wealth. That's having a lot. That means you can have meat anytime you want. They didn't have refrigerators. Most people didn't get to eat meat very often. But if you got, if you got goats, butcher a goat. We're having dinner tonight, right? I had, I had herds of, and flocks more than any who had lived before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I had singers for my parties, both men and women, and I had many concubines. 
which again was the symbol of status, but it also meant a whole lot of fun, a lot of pleasure. Whenever I wanted it, I had it. Um, we look at this guy and we say, man, this guy had, I mean, he had it all. We would look at this kind of person, we'd say, you had it all, you had whatever you wanted. You could go where you wanted, buy what you wanted, do what you wanted, when you wanted. He had it all. And when I listen to this description of this attempt to try to deal with the hevel that is life, I say, this strikes close to home, doesn't it? This, this is an American strategy for trying to make life feel good, make sense, count. This is the American dream. You survey the vast majority of Americans and you ask them, what are the ingredients in the good life? And, and, and I guarantee you, the majority of them will say, well, you know, having a nice house, having a nice car, being able to go on the vacations I want, and buy what I want, and do what I want, being able to have fun, being able to retire early and travel the world, whatever I want. We believe that Money, wealth, stuff, pleasure, entertainment, recreation, fun. We believe that'll make life count and life worthwhile. We believe it. That's why I say this strikes close to home. In fact, we believe this so strongly that it's actually introduced a new vocabulary word into to the English language. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's, it's, it's kind of showed up in the mid-90s and into the late 90s, early 2000s. This vocabulary, you can Google it, you can find out about it. The vocabulary word is affluenza. Not influenza. <laughs> affluenza. Affluence is, is a de disease that results from trying to get more and more and more and have more and more stuff and enjoy life to the hilt. Affluence, uh, one, one uh, author defines it this way, an epidemic of stress, overwork, shopping, and debt caused by the dogged pursuit of the American dream or the bloated and sluggish and unfulfilled feeling that results from one's efforts to keep up with the Joneses. We believe this as Americans. In our culture, it's like, if I just had a little bit more, then my life would finally be everything I expected it to be. Then I could do what I wanted and I wouldn't have all the stress. And so more, 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 fun, 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 entertainment, recreation. I want to, I'm going to, we're going to, someday. In fact, one, one recent study actually uh, uh, surveyed a handful of Americans and 65% said they lose sleep over money and stuff. Do I have enough? How's my retirement account doing? Um, is it all safe and secure? You know, and all of that. We, we believe that this is a solution to the hevel of life. And maybe we should listen a little more closely to the author of Ecclesiastes. What's his conclusion? What does he say? I tried having a blast while I lasted, right? Tried having fun and just enjoying life to the hilt. What's the answer? Look at verse 11 of chapter 2. Then I considered all that my hands had done. All this fun, all this stuff I bought, all, I considered all of that, and the toil that I expended in doing it. And behold, it was all vanity. It was all heaven. It's just, it, you, you get stuff and it wears out and it goes away. It doesn't fill the hole in your heart. It was all hevel and striving after the wind. It didn't bring any lasting value or meaning. And there was nothing. Listen to how sa sad this is. There was nothing to be gained under the sun. He says, I, I tried just enjoying life to the hilt. And I reached the conclusion, this isn't going to do it. There's got to be more than this. There's got to be more to life than just buying and spending and going and traveling and enjoying and having fun. He keeps on with the experiment and he says, okay, well, let's, how about this? Let's try wisdom and knowledge and education and intellect. Let's get really smart and let's, does that deal with it? The more I know about life and the more I understand life and the wiser I am, the better education I have, uh, does that solve the problem of Hevel? And here's what he says about that. He says this in verses 13 and 14 of chapter two. He says, well, then I saw that there is more, more gain in wisdom than folly. It is better to be smart than dumb, right? It is better to be wise than to be a fool. It is better to at least say, you know what? I kind of understand how life generally works and I know how to do life well. That's better than being a fool and making a mess of your life. He says, there, there is more to be gained in that as there is more gain in light than darkness. The wise person has eyes in his head. He, he, he knows what life is about. He knows where he's going. He, he can manage his life well. Um, and the fool walks in darkness. And yet, he says, yet I perceive that the same event happens to them all. Now, more on that in a second. But again, 
This strikes close to home, doesn't it? Get a good education. Did you ever tell your kids that? Like, you know, like, be smart, be wise. I mean, generally speaking, don't be dumb. And he says, that is, that's better. That's better. It's better to not be dumb and to, to actually be smart and have some common sense and live life well. That's better, right? Uh, we, we even believe in American culture, though, that education will solve all the world's problems. Why, why is there so much poverty, hunger, starvation? Education. We believe that. And again, he says there's some truth to that. There is some truth to that. But in the end, the same, the same event happens to them all. And what is that event? Death. Death happens to everybody. Everybody. Look at what he says in chapter 2, verse 16. Look how the wise dies just like the fool. Same event happens. The fool dies. The smart person dies. The ignorant, the educated, both die. The rich, the poor, they're going to die, right? Those that seem to have life all figured out, those that seem to barely ever figure anything out, both die. Both die. Death happens to them all. So he says, man, this is just so depressing. So I hated life. So I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me because it's all hevel. It's all hevel. It's all vanity, hevel. It's all striving after the wind. So I, I, I look around and yeah, it makes more sense to, to be wise, have common sense and make, you know, have a good education, have a good understanding of life, but in the end, you're still gonna die. And it's like, that just kind of puts everything in place. Um, and the experiment keeps going. As you read through Ecclesiastes, the experiment keeps going. He tries things like, he tries hard work and success and accomplishment. He says, you know what? Work hard, you know, get a good career, make a life for yourself. And again, we believe that, don't we? I mean, that's it's part of the American dream. You should work hard. You should be industrious, be diligent, you know, do a lot. Or, or maybe we would say, you should do something meaningful with your life and make a difference in the world. And again, he says, not bad advice. He says, that's okay. He said, you, you know, that's fine. Do that. But think about this. You pour all your energy into whatever the job is, whatever the career is, whatever the company is you started, whatever the church is you started, whatever the ministry you started. You pour all your life into that, your career, your job, your energy, making a difference in the world. And then um, what happens is you're tired and you're exhausted and you're stressed out and you're worried. Are you sure it's worth it? Sure it's worth it, particularly since life flies by and you might die soon? Or what happens if you pour all your energy and all your time and all your effort into this and then when you, when, when you retire or when you die, the guy who takes over for you is a loser. And they take what you worked so hard on and what you invested so much energy and toil into and they drive it into the ground. And within one generation, it's gone. I worked for a department store in, in Ohio when we lived in Ohio. Um, that had been started. It was sort of a local, sort of like Fred Meyer, but, uh, but uh, it was just kind of regional to Ohio. I worked there uh, um, for two years, about. Uh, it had been around for 40 or 50 years. Within three years of me graduating grad school, moving back to Idaho, most of those stores were closed because the guy at the top did not know how to manage it when he took over. So a store started closing left and right. Hevel, is it really worth it? Or he says, you, you work so hard, you work yourself to the bone, you go, 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 you accomplish and accomplish and accomplish. Wouldn't it be sad, he says, if you got to the end of your life and there was no one even to give you a decent funeral because you had never spent time with people because you were working all the time? So it's like, so work hard, fine, but just know in the end, there's got to be more than just that. There's got to be more than success and accomplishment. How many of you have ever heard... Oh, how many of you ever heard the name Lee Iacocca? Right, Lee Iacocca. The crazy thing is, when you listen to the, the author of Ecclesiastes, he's, he's addressing us, it feels like. These are the things we do to try to make life count. Have fun, entertainment, recreation, work hard, accomplishment, success. Well, Lee Iacocca was that man. Lee Iacocca was a, a very well-known, influential, powerful business leader, particularly in the 80s and the early 90s in our country. 
Um, Lee Iacocca was the one who, when the Chrysler Corporation was like about ready to go belly up, Lee Iacocca was the one that was brought in to say, save the day, and he did. He turned the Chrysler Corporation around, and he, he was wealthy and powerful and influential. Lee Iacocca, you know, face Grace magazine covers and all of that. Lee Iacocca had everything you would, you would count as the American dream. And then later in his life, he writes in his autobiography, he says this. He says, here I am in the twilight years of my life, and I'm wondering what it's all about. He has success, he has accomplishment, he has status, he has wealth, he can go where he wants, do what he wants. By all accounts, he's achieved the good life according to the American dream. And as his life begins to peter out, here I sit, he says, wondering what it's all about. And then he goes on and he says, I can tell you this for certain, that fame and fortune are for the birds. He had it all. And looking back, he's like, I'm not so sure it really matters. Hevel, hevel, hevel. And it raises a question for you and for me. And the question is this. What are you investing your life in? What are you pouring your life into? What, what are you telling your kids to invest their life in? Get a good education, get the scholarships, go to college so you can get a good career, so maybe you can retire young. So, by all accounts, that's what we Americans believe we should be telling our kids to invest their life in, isn't it? And yet the author of Ecclesiastes and Lee Iacocca would say, I'm not so sure it's enough. In view of all of this, it's hevel, hevel, hevel. Well, happy Sunday morning, right? This is, this is, this is kind of a downer. I'm sure glad I got out of bed and came to church today. Here's the thing. The author of Ecclesiastes goes through all this grand experiment, stares really the hevel that is life in the face, so that he can kind of give us a, a cold dose of reality and say, so here's the solution. Here's the solution. So what I want to do is I want to just read some of his solution. It actually is almost like the chorus to the book. If the book of Ecclesiastes were like a song, this would be like the chorus. It's repeated over and over and over again throughout the book. This is his solution. So we're going to read it. But before I do, I hazard to guess that at first, first blush, when you hear his solution, you might feel like, gee, that's not, I don't know if that's spiritual enough. I'm not so sure this solution, there's got to be a more spiritual solution. But I think this is a very wise solution. And it provides really good perspective to us. Listen to what he says. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. This is the first place the chorus shows up. Ecclesiastes 2, 24 and 25 says, There is nothing better for a person than this, that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in all his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God, for apart from him, who can enjoy anything at all? His, his solution is, you know what? Life's going to fly by. It's not always going to make sense. So you know what? Just make the most of it. Enjoy it. Go home, have a good dinner. Have a nice drink. Enjoy your family. And remember, this is a gift from God that you get to be alive. He, he says it again, chapter 3. This is the chorus. It keeps showing up. Chapter 3, he says, What gain does the worker have from all his toil? I've seen all the business that God has given to the children of men to be busy with, and they're going, running around with their heads. They're cut off like a chicken, right? And they're just going crazy. He has made everything beautiful in its time. You might not be able to see where it's all going, and it might not always make sense, but guess what? God will make it beautiful in its time. Not only that, he's put eternity into man's hearts, yet so that he cannot find out uh, all that God has done from the beginning to end. There's this call towards eternity. We don't totally understand. We can't make sense out of life. So he says, so I've perceived that there's nothing better for people to do than this, than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should just eat and drink and take pleasure in their work, their toil, because that's God's gift to men. Over and over and over in the book. This is his solution to the fact that life is hevel. 
what he's basically doing is he's saying, look, I want you to drink a cold dose of reality. Life isn't always as neat and tidy as you expect. Life doesn't always work. The Proverbs say one thing, but life in reality is a little bit different. It's not always cookie cutter clean and life doesn't always work out. Life doesn't always make sense and it races by and before you know it, you're staring death in the face and you don't want to get to that point saying, you know what? Hmm, I wonder what all this was about. Was my life worth it? So he says, just accept and be happily reconciled to the fact that that's the way life is and enjoy the life God has given you. Go, he says, eat and drink. In fact, chapter 9, he says it again. Chapter 9, he says, go, eat your bread with joy. Drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love. All the days of your vain, your heavenly life uh, that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life. And in your toil at which you toil under the sun, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. That's his initial solution. That's, that's his, his, like, you have been given a gift from God called life. It doesn't always make sense. And it races by, and sometimes it's disappointing, and sometimes it's frustrating, but guess what? Drink it in and savor it and enjoy it because it's a gift from the hand of God. And then he says, in chapter 12, the last chapter, he says, so this, this is what I have in mind. Chapter 12, verse 1, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Before the evil days come and the years draw near, which you say, man, I have no pleasure in them. In other words, what he's saying is, you need to learn this lesson that life is hard, life is confusing, life flies by, and you should do it while you're young. And then in the midst of that, you should remember that life is a gift from the hand of God. And so you should live your life and enjoy your life and take your life in and live it to the hilt and remember your creator and you should start now. You should start now until life gets to a point where you think, what was all that about? What was all that about? Remember your creator in the days of your youth. And the very last words of the book are this. Right at the end, the the editor who's kind of compiled these journal notes puts his commentary on it in the final couple sentences. He says, so the end of the matter when all has been heard is this, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment. Like he's gonna sort it all out. He's gonna make sense out of the bad, the good, the fair, the unfair, the pain and the, the pleasurable parts of life. He'll sort it all out and he'll make sense out of it all for you someday. He'll bring it all to judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. So honor him, remember him, live for him. Do you you hear the advice? Like when I was probably 20, 21, the sage advice of Ecclesiastes wouldn't have resonated with me like it does now. But at this stage of life, it resonates loud and clear. Like life doesn't always make sense. Life flies by, it's hevel. It's challenging, it's difficult, it's frustrating, it's confusing, and before you know it, you're old and you didn't even know how you got there. That's life. So guess what? Enjoy it. Enjoy this thing called life. Enjoy your life. Don't keep looking at his life or don't keep looking at her life and saying, I wish my life were like. I wish my life turned out like. I never thought my life would be like. This is the life you've got. This is the life that the hand of God has given you. Savor it, because life is hevel. Not empty, not pointless, not meaningless, just fleeting and a little bit tricky to understand. So this is, you, you get one shot at it, so live it, savor it, and do so knowing that it's a gift from your creator. Knowing that this life, you couldn't have, he gave it to you. He gave it to you, so remember him. And as you're savoring this life, remember him and live it with him and live it for him because it's a gift from his hand. That, my friends, is some terribly powerful perspective on this thing called life. In a nutshell, Ecclesiastes says this to us. It says, remember your creator and savor the life he's given you. When you look at life and you realize how fast it flies by and how tricky it can be to understand, remember your creator and savor 
this thing called life that he gave you. Not because it always goes the way you expect, not because it always turns out the way you want, not because it always makes sense, but because it's your life and it's a gift from his hand. So remember your creator and savor the life he's given you. Now, with that in mind, what testament was Ecclesiastes found in? Old or new? Ecclesiastes is in the Old Testament, which means Ecclesiastes is written before who came? Before Jesus. So our author's trying to explore life and deal with life and the hevel that is life, and he did so before God became flesh and dwelt among us. He didn't know that God would come among us and he would experience the hevel that is life. He didn't know that God himself and the person of Jesus would live and dwell on this life and experience the frustration and the, the hurt and the trouble and the confusion and the fleeting nature of life. He didn't know that, but you do and I do. He didn't know that this, that, that this God becoming flesh and experience was how God was gonna draw all people to himself. He didn't know that. He didn't know that God himself was gonna have his life cut short in his prime by essentially a lynch mob. The author of Hebrew, or Ecclesiastes didn't know that. And he didn't know that God himself, after hanging on a cross, would deal a death blow to the ultimate heaven maker, death itself. He didn't know that Jesus would rise from the dead. And that death, death isn't the, isn't the end. Death is just a comma in the sentence that is your life, not a period. He didn't know that. But those of us who know Jesus do. We do. And that gives us all the more reason to trust our Savior, to trust our Creator, to remember Him, and to do life with Him, and to savor the good life He's given us. Knowing the fact that death is a defeated enemy takes the hevel that is life and says, it's going to fly by and it's not always going to make sense, but God will bring all things to account and He'll sort it all out because He's already proven it in the person. Jesus. So the ultimate solution to the hevel that is life is to remember your creator who became flesh and lived among you and knows what it's like to live this life and savor the gift that is your life. It's so easy in life to see what's wrong with it, to see the things that don't make sense, to deal with the frustration, right? It's so easy to find the black spot on the white shirt instead of realizing most of the shirt is still white. It's so easy to find what's wrong and the things that don't make sense. And the author of Ecclesiastes says to us, it's not worth it. It's not worth it trying to figure it all out and sort it all out and get frustrated and fret and uh, wrestle and get all angsty about it. The best thing you can do is savor the life God has given you. Live it to the hilt and remember your creator. And so, as we transition out of 2018 and we transition into 2019, my encouragement to you and to me would be, let's plan in 2019 to remember our creator. Let's plan, not just wish, not just hope. Let's plan. Let's plan to remember our creator and do life with God in 2019. Let's receive the life he's given us with gratitude. Let's arrange our life around him. Let's savor this thing called life. If we believe the life we have is a gift from God, then let's live it to the hilt for his sake for his honor, for his glory, knowing he's going to sort it all out in the end. And let's receive all of this as a gift from his hand. Remember your creator and savor the life that he's given you.